we have our guest of honor, Honorable Chairman of Avalon Consulting India and Vice President of IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industries, Sri Raj Nayarji. But before I invite him to address the gathering, I would like to request my technical team to kindly relay a small film made on life and work of Sri Raj Nayar. Raj Nair is the Vice President of IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry and is currently serving as the Chairman of four companies, Avalon Consulting, Avalon Global Research, Ugam Solutions and Germinate Solutions Private Limited. He has over four decades of experience ranging from consumer durables marketing to merchant banking, from market research to strategy consulting, from big data analytics to artificial intelligence based social media analytics. He is an engineering graduate from IIT Bombay and holds a postgraduate in business management from IIM Ahmedabad. He also holds a degree in general law from the University of Mumbai. Across his career, Sri Nair has been known as a thought leader and pioneer in the use of innovation to create competitive advantage. He is an active charter member of TIE Mumbai and mentors young entrepreneurs. We are honored to welcome Sri Raj Nair. Please welcome with a bigger applause the guest of honor of this session, Sri Raj Nayarji. Distinguished members on the dais and in the audience, and my young friends who are gathered in here in huge numbers. I'm very impressed by the way this, the organizers have selected the topic. And for another reason, this morning I was told to be ready at 8 o'clock. But the two gentlemen who came to pick me up were punctual. They came, in fact, half an hour earlier. I've got this bad habit of wanting to be early rather than late. So I too was ready at 7.30. So I got the benefit of attending some of the lectures this morning. I saw the powerful speeches that were delivered, especially by the politicians. I can never be a match to them. They are amazing speakers, and you've seen that. Um, you've heard a leading academician convincing you that GDH is far more important than GDP. You heard a politician explaining the same thing. And now you had a spiritual leader telling you the same thing, but also how, teaching you how to seek inner peace. So there is very little value if I were to again spend the next 10 minutes trying to prove to you that GDH is much more relevant than GDP. Instead, I'll put on my corporate hat. And by that I mean, we don't fall in love with an idea. We want to take it to the next step. So, out here I would suggest that it's to know that GDH is more important than GDP is a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition for you to be able to move the GDH in this country or in the world anywhere beyond where it is today. So, I have just three thoughts I'd like to sh share with you on what needs to be looked at if you want to move the needle of GDH or happiness a little further. The first point is that the G or the gross in GDP or GDH is somewhat misleading. The gross is as misleading as the average. It's not proper to say that my leg is in a furnace, my head is in, the, in a freezer, but on the whole, I'm, on an average, I'm okay. That's what happens when you take the GDH or per capita GDH. All depends on how well this GDH has been distributed in the population. If it's all concentrated in 10%, if most of the happiness is concentrated in 10% of the population, then 90% are not that happy. What's the use of a high GDH? So you've got to think about and see how you can make this distribution happen. I think one of the speakers alluded to that. The second thing I would like to talk about is the need to measure. 
whatever cannot be measured cannot be managed. So you can do a lot of things, but you don't know whether it's really happening. And the third point I'd like to make is that managing, even after you have figured out how to measure it, is not going to be child's play in the years to come because technology is disrupting our social fabric, the way we interact with each other, the way we communicate with each other, the way we entertain ourselves. Almost everything is getting disrupted. So what worked as a solution in the last 10 years will be quite different from what you guys, you youngsters have to do when you're out there in the world trying to make India and the world a happier place. So let me just go into a little more detail on each of these three points. Take a look at the US elections. Hillary Clinton felt, and I'm not giving a political talk, Hillary Clinton said that Obama and her party, the Democratic Party, had done a great job of pulling America out of the pits that it was in when the country was handed over to them of the Bush regime. It also, she was also convinced, and she talked about it, that unemployment rate has come down to 5.3%, which is unheard of in the UK, US. So she took it for granted that she will win the election. In fact, most of us thought she will. But Trump had other ideas. Being a businessman, he said, look, I'm sure there'll be some fault line somewhere, despite the fact that America has become a better place than it was eight years ago. What do we do in business? We segment customers and he figured out there are enough segments of customers, a huge number of customers, his voters, in the heartland of America, which had lost jobs, were unhappy, where some towns were bankrupt, some companies had closed down, mines had closed down, and he said, okay, here's the opportunity. They're unhappy, I'll tell them that they are not happy, I'll tell them I'll make you happy. He looked them in the eye and said, I and gave all kinds of promises. I don't know how many he'll fulfill, but he gave them hope of happiness. He said, I'll build a wall across Mexico so no one come, can come and take your jobs, and so on and so forth. I'll not allow China to send their products into the country and stop manufacturing in, in the US. I will not allow American companies to go and set up factories outside and then sell the products in America. I'm going to get you jobs. They made, became happy and they voted for him. Another example, Brexit. Cameron felt that, and a lot of economists felt, that the UK, that Britain, was, a, it was much better off ever since it joined the European Union. The overall economic numbers looked good. But even though a large part of the UK economy, almost as half of it, is concentrated in and around London, there was a large population outside London which was feeling the ill effects of the EU membership. They were unhappy. So what did they do? They made sure that they voted to their leg, feet and got the UK out of the European Union. I'm not saying it's a wise decision or, an, or, a, or not a wise decision. I'm saying they were unhappy. They voted with their feet in a democracy, got them out, and kicked the, uh, Mac, um, Cameron out of the office. So we are seeing clear evidence that if you're not happy, you can't keep your people happy. So some of you are going to be political leaders, and this is going to be very important for you. Even corporate leaders, if you can't keep your people happy, you're going to have problems in running your business, or running your government, or running your party, or running the country. I had a very interesting I had a very interesting episode a few months ago an American client of ours and I were driving from the airport into the city of Mumbai through Dharavi the big slum and the conversation suddenly stopped soon after we got out of Dharavi he again started talking he says you know what I noticed a lot of little children with torn clothes, no footwear, laughing and dancing and playing. No, I can't understand this contradiction. Whereas back home, my children are sulking. I give them everything, but they're still sulking. So he says, how do you explain that? 
So I told him that probably the answer lies in the fact that we have in India been brought up to understand that happiness comes not necessarily out of material wealth, owning or grabbing everything, but by reducing our needs to fit with our understanding. So that brings me to the second point about measurement. There have to be some metrics on the basis of which you can measure. So if I have a look at our, our, what our forefathers taught our parents and what they've taught us, that if you look at that, the essence of it is that happiness can be mathematically represented by having needs and desires in the numerator and the means to fulfill those needs in the denominator. If that ratio is one or less than one, you'll be happy. If it's above one, you'll be unhappy. So as you bring that ratio down to zero, you'll become the happiest soul that has ever lived on earth. That is why our rishis tell us, give up your needs, you don't need. Give up material wants, you'll become a happy person. It's simply the numerator being brought closer and closer to zero. Denominator can remain whatever it is. The third point is about technological disruption. The future is very difficult for us to tell. But at least as far as technology is concerned, it's possible to join the dots and figure out what the world will be a few years from now. In fact, I'd given a talk at IIT recently when they invited me to deliver the institute lecture. So if you ever want to go and just go to the IIT website or to our company's website. So I'll spare you more details about that. Think of the world of tomorrow when most, most of you heard of remote office working where for instance, in IBM Global, 60% of the employees around the world work from home. If you're not facing each other, it's difficult to manage, but they've overcome that. Today, in, in today's world, we are very, very, very connected. But the more connected we are, the more lonely we're becoming. We are getting addicted to the machine and not to all the people we connect. We send out tweets to 500 followers but we are not connecting with them. We are becoming lonelier. The more lonely you become, the more unhappy you become. I don't know whether you are aware that this week, Prime Minister Theresa May has appointed a minister for loneliness. Actually appointed a minister for loneliness because she feels if the loneliness of the older people and the loneliness of the young people who are totally connected and wired with their devices and not with people is not handled, She's going to have a very unhappy populace and she'll be thrown out of office. I just want to leave this thought with you just for want of time. I would love to tell you more. That think about the technological disruptions that are going to happen and by the time you come into the world, you'll need to figure out a way to create happiness. Maybe you'll create a chief lon loneliness officer or in your political party you'll create a chief happiness officer but you'll have to figure out a way. I don't have the answer. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Raj Nair Ji.